Welcome to the On a Mission Mojo podcast, where I have the pleasure of interviewing impact-driven founders, entrepreneurs, authors, and business experts who are actively working to create a positive difference in our world. I'm your host, Lori Young, a branding specialist, certified master marketer, and a passionate advocate for brands that possess heart, soul, and an unwavering commitment to drive change for humanity. It takes grit, a visionary mindset, and an abundance of mojo to navigate this journey. And the stories I share will undoubtedly ignite your passion. If you're seeking an infusion of inspiration, motivation, and valuable insights to amplify your impact, let's dive right in. Welcome to episode eight of On A Mission Mojo podcast. We're going to have a lot of fun uh, today. We're going to be talking about something that we haven't talked about uh, before, and that is as our business grows and we expand, we are going to need to bring on more people to help us. And hopefully as we grow bigger and bigger and bigger, that organization gets bigger and you have more and more people uh, to that you have to manage, that you have to create a culture for. And I think it's really important for us to, as business owners, we're thinking about like making a difference in the world and creating a positive impact on humanity. Before we can do that, we have to do that in our own backyard. And that is within our own organization. We have to create that culture that's making a difference um, for the people that are working with us and serving us and helping us to carry out the mission. So that is what we're going to be talking about today. And I have like a really special guest uh, with us today, and I'm going to introduce him. Uh, today, we have Luis Scott, a highly respected attorney, sought after speaker, author, and dynamic entrepreneur, founder of Eight Figure Firm Consulting. Luis's entrepreneurial spirit has revolutionized entrepreneurship. Join us as he shares insights, inspiring stories, and invaluable wisdom to empower entrepreneurs on their journey to extraordinary success. Get ready to be motivated and equipped with the tools to thrive in business and beyond. So welcome, Luis, for being here. I'm so glad that you uh, uh, have joined me on the show. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here and thank you for having me on. Looking forward yeah. to the conversation. Awesome. So let's start by kind of sharing with the audience just your mission uh, in the world, like what it is that you're wanting to to do uh, in your yeah. lifetime. I mean, that that's a great question. By the way, I've never been on, on a show where somebody asked me what my mission is uh, in my life. So I love talking about this because uh, 20 years ago when I was in my early 20s and uh, I had no idea what my mission was. Mm -hmm. And I think so many of us try to find purpose in life. Yes. And we spend so many times just like, what is our purpose? What is our purpose? And for those of you guys who who haven't found your purpose yet, I can tell you, it took me until I was almost 35 years old before I figured out what my purpose was in life. And my purpose was uh, to develop, uh, to be, a, you know, to lead a life of significance. And so my mission is that whatever that I, whatever I do, I'm mm -hmm. leading a life of significance to the people that I'm working with. That's awesome. That's, and that, you know, what I like about that, what I like about that mission and that purpose is that it can evolve over time. Yes. I was talking to, I was talking to another guest and I'd asked her that question and she said, you know, I think my mission evolves. And I think that it's true. Your mission is very, you know, very like um, succinct, but it's something that kind of can be weaved in like whatever you decide to do in your life, whatever touch points you have in your life, you can weave that mission and that purpose through it. Absolutely. Well, that was one of the things that inspired me the most is that I didn't have to be pigeonholed into something. You know, I remember when I was trying to develop my brand online, mm -hmm. uh, somebody was like, you got to pick a certain you know, niche and you, you have to go in this direction and you have to become a specialist in this. And I said, but there's a lot of things that I, that I'm, that I love, you know, I love sports, mm -hmm. but I also love my family and I love my kids and I love my business. And I did not want to, you know, pigeon my, you know, pigeonhole myself into one thing. And so one day I just realized my mission is to just be significant to mm -hmm. as many people as possible, whether that's in personal relationships, professional relationships, the business context, whatever I was doing, playing softball for, for, for a, uh, you know, a rec league or something, I just wanted to be significant. 
and give more than I received uh, when it came to my contribution in life. And so that's what's led me uh, over the last, I guess, five, six years is how can I be more significant to the people I work with, to the people who work for me and to mm-hmm. the clients that I represent? I love that. I love that. It's, it's very similar to like my own mission. For me, it's just like, I want to make a difference uh, in the world. And I, however, and I think for one of me, like for me too, it's like love is like a big value of mine. So it's like, mm-hmm. how can I show love in mm-hmm. my everyday interactions with people, with my clients, with my family, with, you know, what does that look like? You know, mm-hmm. love is so big, but yeah. how do, how am I spreading love? Like when I leave this earth, you know, I want people to say she was a really loving person, mm. Yes. you know? Yeah. So let's talk about your story because to me, it's fascinating and I can't wait to uh, hear about it. Uh, Luis has written a book called it has to, it has to hurt. And I know that comes from somewhere. So I want to (laughs) hear where did that come from? Kind of what led you to like your purpose uh, today? I mean, one of the things that I think that people have a misconception about is that life should be easy. And Mm. so when you believe that life should be easy, you're in a perpetual state state of desperation when you're going from uh, you know uh, points of misery to points of misery. I think that's uh, and that could be perspective. You know, we could be going from mountaintop to mountaintop or valley to valley. Like it, the yes. perspective really matters. But uh, I was that person. You know, for a long time, I, I asked myself why was I going through things over and over again. It shouldn't be this way. I would tell myself that over and over. I shouldn't be sad that I didn't get picked for my the starting role in baseball. I shouldn't be sad that I didn't get the job that I wanted. I shouldn't be sad that my business failed. I should be happy. I should be optimistic. And I came to a realization that, you know what? I, I was I was mistaken. It, it has to hurt. Life just hurts. It's like, it is what it is. You go through things and the perspective that you should have is not, I should not be suffering these things, but rather, what do I do next? What mm-hmm. What is the decision that I'm going to make in this moment where I'm suffering something that I don't want to experience? And I think that that was, that was something that, that really drove me as I was thinking about writing It Has to Hurt was it can hurt and you can still enjoy the journey. You can still enjoy mm-hmm. building your business uh, even when people disappoint you. And I think, you know, I, I love that you mentioned love because um, – my two points of leadership are uh, show love and show grace, uh, lead mm-hmm. with love and show grace. I and I that. think that when you lead with love and you show grace, you're going to find yourself on the quote unquote short end of the stick. A lot of times you're going to find yourself giving more to a friend than mm-hmm. they give to you, giving yes. more to a partner than they give to you, giving more to a business than it gives to you. And yes. I think that, that that's hurtful. And so mm-hmm. that's what inspired the book was I had gone through so many failures in my life. But yet I was a success in, in, in society's eyes. And what I, what I realized is that there was someone else who was hurting and who was using the hurt as a limitation. And I wanted to let them know that the hurt should not be a limitation. Really, it should be a springboard into what they were purposed for. Absolutely. Yeah. It reminds me of like regular conversations that I have with my uh, college son. You know, I think he's still kind of navigating that of like, Oh, I feel so angry today. Or I feel like, I feel so sad today. Like, why am I, why do I have to feel this way? Why do I, I said, it will pass. It's, yeah. it's pay attention to it. What is it trying to tell you? And, mm-hmm. you know, in it, in the moment when we're hurting and we think that things are really bad, we think, oh my God, we're not going to get out of this. Right. Mm-hmm. And we have to realize that, like you said, life is full of hurts. It's never going to not hurt. There's always going to be like these peaks and these valleys. You're sometimes we're going to be on top of the world and like, Oh my God, life is amazing. My business is exploding. This is fantastic. And then you can just fall right down to a valley and go, Oh my God, what am I doing? This is horrible. Absolutely. And, and it, and it doesn't even have to be business related, right? Cause you could have right. the most amazing peak of your business but be suffering with a, with a medical illness or your yes. family suffering with a med- medical illness, you know? And so I think that we're always going to have that pain. A, a friend of mine many years ago really put in perspective. And he said that instead of asking why me start mm-hmm. asking what's next, 
What's and I next? thought that, that was okay. so powerful because like, how do you get out of this state of hurt is stop asking why me and start mm -hmm. asking what's next? What should I take from this experience so that I can propel myself? I love that. I'm going to use that. Like I get, I love these, get, I love podcast interviews because I always get like these little tidbits of uh, things. It's like, oh, that's a good one. I'm going to use that one. <laughs> so that's awesome. So let's switch over kind of to business. You had um, eight failed businesses, right? right. And, you know, failed, you know, air quotes is, I don't know. I don't like to look at like things as like failures, honestly. Like I just mm -hmm. feel like they're stepping stones sure. um, and growth opportunities. But for your purposes, let's say you had eight failed businesses, right? Tell mm -hmm. me about that kind of that experience. So I was a serial entrepreneur from the very beginning. When I was young, mm -hmm. um, I lived in Puerto Rico. My grandmother would say, you know, can you go buy milk at the corner store? And I said, absolutely. Can I keep the change? Like that was my first uh, <laughs> you know, entrepreneurial, you know, experience. And then, right. and then I realized that if I did a little more, my parents would pay me to cut the grass or to mow the lawn or to, you know, you know, to wash cars or, or even ironing. I would, I would, uh, I would iron all of their clothes for the week and they, they'd give me an amazing $3, you know, for ironing right. clothes. I just realized that I was like totally underpaid. I, I was learning. Uh, yes. the concept of, <laughs> yeah. I, I had to learn the concept of my value. Right. Right. And so, but when, when I, because I had this uh, entrepreneur spirit, I always knew that I wanted to start a business and mm -hmm. I didn't have the money to start a, a brick and mortar business. And so I always tried to do things that seemed seemed quote unquote easy. And as, and as you know, okay. it's never easy. There's no business that's easy. And so one of the business that I started was I started selling vitamins online. Like that was, okay. a, I, I had found a, a, a manufacturer of vitamins. Mm -hmm. Everybody needed vitamins, right? Let's sell right. vitamins online. You just put those puppies on a website and the money just starts flowing. Well, guess what? It doesn't just start flowing. You got to right. market, you got to, you got to do all these things. And so uh, I tried that for about six months to eight months and I couldn't get anybody to buy my vitamins because I was a 21 year old person who had no medical degree. <laughs> All right. You know, I was selling vitamins that, that uh, I don't even know where they were from. Right. Like, right, right. Drop shipping wasn't as popular back then. And so yes. uh, Amazon was still in the bankruptcy state. And so I wasn't able to like convince people like go online and buy vitamins. Sure. And so that didn't, that, that didn't really work out. I ended up losing like $10,000 on that. Ooh, on that okay. investment. Then I, I started a, a, a penny auction again. I don't know. I don't, I can't start a brick and mortar. I have a day job. I'm right. working at nights. I start a penny auction site. There's uh, sites out there like Deal Dash or something like that. Hmm. And okay. uh, I thought this was super easy. You just get a web developer. They start a penny site. You pay people. Thousands of people come bet at this penny site because we have so many uh, gamblers out there. That didn't work. And 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 part okay. of it was because I didn't have the um, the drive for it. And so sure. standing up for two o'clock in the morning trying to, you know, package products that people were winning and then, you know, dealing with disputes was just getting very overwhelming. And so that didn't work out for me. Okay. Uh, and then I started a, uh, a, another business. I wanted to, to have, I, I had heard of the Huffington post and I was like, yes, uh -huh. right. So, so the Huffington post, the way it started was it was like a news site aggregator and then they got their own journalist and not, and then it became its own, you know, independent, um, organization. Mm -hmm. I was like, if they can do it, I, I can do it. Now, I didn't know that they had the backing of hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> and so I decided I'm going to be a, 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 a news aggregator. And so I was going to okay. start a website and I was going to pull news from different places. And then I was going to sell ad space. Well, guess what? Nobody wants to advertise on my website. <laughs> like okay. it, was, uh, it was one of those things nobody really wanted to advertise right. on my site. Um, and every one of these experiences was just teaching me something different. It was, you know, it was teaching me the, the, that I needed to learn how to deal with disputes when people weren't happy. It dealt, it, it taught me that I should probably plan out things before I make an investment into a business. Mm -hmm. It taught me that easy money doesn't exist in this world. Uh, you know, you, it takes some effort and some work, even if, even if you're dealing in the, you know, the supernatural, you, you hear about. Uh, co coaches out there and books out there about the supernatural quantum leap that happens in life, you sure. still have some work. It doesn't just like, yes, 
fall on your lap, you know, a lotto ticket with the winning number to a billion dollar lotto. And I was learning these principles. And, and, and then, uh, and then I started getting into things that were a little bit more of, of my passion was I did earn enough to where I can get into brick and mortar. And I started a barbershop, which is actually still in existence eight years later. And, oh, wow. and I started okay. a law firm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I started a law firm that, that really took off and that gave me the confidence to deal with employees. And, and then I transitioned that into a second law firm, which I, which grew into almost 200 employees. Then I transitioned that into a consulting business, which is where I am today. So uh, it was all of those failures that led me to where I am today, which is understanding the mechanics of starting and growing a business. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's just entrepreneurship. I, I feel like sometimes when you have like that entrepreneurial bug, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of you kind of like are a serial entrepreneur. Like you start yeah. like little things like from early on and, and just yeah. kind of grow. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's good stuff. So you have obviously gotten over the hurdle of failed businesses and are now onto successful businesses. And so you have uh, the ability to teach our listeners or share uh, some insights with our listeners on, mm. you know, just what, makes a business like successful. And as I talked about in the beginning, we're kind of dive into like creating a thriving company culture. You mm -hmm. built your law firm to 200 people. That's a lot of people. I've worked for organizations that, you know, are that many people as well. And it can be challenging uh, yeah. to create a thriving company culture. My spouse works for mm -hmm. Home Depot. That's mm -hmm. like huge yeah. uh and like seeing you know what she goes through on a regular basis of just navigating and how she has to manage and lead all of her people to right. be in alignment with the Home Depot company culture it's not easy yeah i mean Home Depot that's that's a that's a that's a beast right i mean you're yeah. talking about tens of thousands i uh, the 200 it pales in comparison but one thing that never changes is that uh, people are in, in, in groups, people are kind of all predictable and they're the same, but they're very individualistic, but mm -hmm. they're, you know, the people have the same tendencies. Like we all eat breakfast generally around the same time. We eat lunch around the same time. We travel around the same time. We go to certain locations. Uh, you, that that's how hotels can determine how many rooms they need available during the summer. And that's how, uh, you go to a ballpark. They never run out of hot dogs and beer because they know the predictability of, of people, but, mm -hmm. but the individual person can be very challenging. Uh, even if the group is not, uh, is predictable to some extent. Right. And I, I will say, you know, you mentioned, you asked, you, you were saying about uh, sharing what makes a business successful. And so before I go into kind of the, the how to develop a great culture, mm -hmm. I, I will tell you that one of the most um, important lessons that I learned was to sell the product that you are actually passionate about. Okay. If, you, if you start a business, Mm -hmm. And the product you're selling, you are not living and breathing that product. It's very likely that you will give up when the going gets tough. Yes. And so you have to sell something that you are super, super passionate about. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at all of my failed businesses, I was not passionate about any of those products. I was not Got passionate. It. I was simply doing it to make money. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. trying to make money is a good motivator. It's not a great motivator. Right. And it's generally speaking, you're only going to do it until it gets tough and right. then you start giving up. So you got to be really, really passionate about the product to start off with. And then you have to deliver that passion to your team as you start bringing them on. And if you don't have it, very difficult to transmit that passion to the team and they're going to get it. They're going to know when right. you start taking off uh, from work because you want to go play golf and they're you know at the office. They're right. going to they're gonna say, wait a second, he's not that passionate about this business. Mm -hmm. Like, why don't we just slack off? And so right. I think that that's what it takes to be successful to start off with. Yeah, absolutely. Like passion is uh, so important. It reminds me like last year, I kind of took took away one of my offers. Um, you know, so whether it's a product or service, it's kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, the same. You have to be passionate about it. And I literally just got rid of, uh, you know, one of my services because it's like this service stresses me out. I'm, I don't enjoy it. I'm not passionate about it. And I just stuck with 
what I'm passionate about. I love branding. I love website design and I love content management like hmm. that. I could just talk about all day long. I could. Yeah. So it's just like, that's, that's my thing. Um, yeah. And we also offer like launch management services where we help uh, businesses like launch courses and offers. And it's just like, Oh, stressful. So <laughs> You didn't yeah. like the launching of courses part. That was not, that was not your thing. No, I, I don't even mind. Like, I don't even mind like writing, uh, all of the content to sell that, uh, mm -hmm. course, right? Like writing the sales page for it, you know, like all of that designing the sales page for it, writing sales emails that, that, uh, you could use to sell it. It's all part of content and design and all that. I'm good with that. It's just the the strategy of launching it and like, well, how do we do it? Are we going to do a webinar? Are we going to do this? Like that? It's just like hire a launch manager for that. <laughs> we'll write all your content for you, but <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. What else does it take? I know that you have kind of identified like, like seven different things. I think you had said like mm -hmm. that are really important to build a thriving culture. Well, so I, I wrote a, uh, an ebook called The Nine Principles of Exponential Growth, where it, it kind of talks about how uh, there's there's three uh, uh, parts of really building a successful business in general, mm -hmm. vision, mission, values. All of that leads mm -hmm. to having a thriving culture. I call that the foundation of the business. Sure. And the foundation of the business is, is, is the most critical part, but it's the part that a lot of people don't do because they don't see the ROI. And so they don't see that there's a return on investment. Like what's the ROI of a vision? What's the ROI of a mission? And right. what I tell people is the ROI is that if you want to attract and retain the best people, you need to have a vision that people can get excited about and you need to have a mission that people can actually self actualize into. And so for me, like eight figure firm consulting, our, our vision is to be the leading authority in law firm building. And mm -hmm. our mission is to help a hundred law firms reach eight figures in predictable revenue. So I focus on, 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 on consulting law firms specifically, but when it comes to uh, the the people that we hire, I don't mm -hmm. hire lawyers. The majority of the people that I that I uh, hire are not lawyers. So why are they so excited about what we do? And I think the reason is that uh, I have crafted a vision statement to be the leading authority mm -hmm. in law firm building mm -hmm. as a, a, an education center. So I tell people, well, we're building as an education center. So I find a lot of talent in people who love to teach mm, and people okay. who love to coach. And people mm -hmm. who love to give their lives in service to others, right. and so the vision and mission and your and your and your uh, core values are foundationally how you intertwine and interweave the the people and the business to create a new fabric, and it's like the the interweaving of fabrics. And so one of the things that you want to do as you're growing your organization is you want to ask yourself, would the person who I am hiring Mm -hmm. be willing to follow me in this vision and mission that I have. Like mm -hmm. that's what you're, that's what you're looking for is you're looking for people who say, yes, I'm willing to, to, to lock arms with you in this vision and mission. And right. if you don't have somebody who's willing to lock arms, then it's very unlikely that they're going to survive the hard times. It goes back to if the owner has mm -hmm. to have passion over the product or service, so does the employee, the employee has to have passion over the product or service. And so for me, building a strong culture is first having the foundation, vision, mission, and core values, service standards, knowing what the expectations are. Uh, the second thing is providing an opportunity for people to grow so that they can grow uh, personally, professionally, and financially. And number three is removing chaos and toxicity from the, from the workplace mm -hmm. so that they enjoy coming to work. And what I used to tell people in, in, my, in my previous law firm where, I, where we had hundreds of employees was that you only have one life experience and I wanted to make sure it was the best experience possible. We wanted people to enjoy coming into work. We wanted to create mm -hmm. an environment where people actually wanted to come into work. And that was a very foreign uh, uh, subject when you think mm -hmm. about what's happened with, with uh, the pandemic and a lot of people going virtual. And, and in fact, I was uh, on a radio show recently where they were talking about the level of disengagement is is a uh, 67 percent of employees are disengaged the highest disengagement rate in the last decade is happening right now and i right. think that we have to commit ourselves to creating places where people want to work we have to commit ourselves 
to creating an environment that's free of chaos and toxicity. We have to commit ourselves to growing people personally and professionally, and we have to commit ourselves to interweaving the personal goals of an individual with the company goals and the vision and mission of the company. If you do that, you're going to create a thriving organization. Sounds so easy, but it's not. <laughs> I know. I mean, I just, I, you know, there's so many questions I had, like, as you were talking about, let's back up to kind of step one, which is uh, mission, vision, and values, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, for instance, I went on your website before we talked and I, you know, read your company values. That's step one. Boy, you better like have those values front and center on your website for anyone who might be interested in working for your organization. They can read those values and say, yes, like I read yours and I'm like, oh, I like this guy. Like mm -hmm. I resonate with him. Like I really love his values. They're aligned with mine. Yes. Right. Here is the problem that I see oftentimes is number one, how do we, how do we hire for that? Right. Mm -hmm. How do we, you know, we can ask you know, ask people that we're interviewing, you know, what is it about, you know, my company values that resonate with you? Or I don't know what kind of questions, right? Well, I do go through whenever I hire, like I do go through my values um, because I want to make it clear, like you said, kind of set the expectation. And I always say like, what is it about those values that resonate with you? Right. Mm -hmm. it, do, are, are there any other tips like that you would like recommend for business mm -hmm. owners and founders that are trying to really find someone that you, like you said, that's passionate about your vision and mission and truly aligned on a personal level with your company values? First of all, you have to believe in your values and, and mm -hmm. they have to be, they have to be so core to who you are that you can't help to, but talk about it. And mm -hmm. I, and I think when I start working with organizations and entrepreneurs, what I find is I ask them what their core values are. They, they go in their filing cabin and they dust it off and let me, let me dust this core value sheet out. Let me read it to you. Right. Right. That's not a part of who they are because right. if it was, they would know, they would know their core values. Absolutely. And so I think the number one, the first thing is like it being a part of, of who you are and living out your core values. So they have to be core values that you can live out. You know, when I think about extreme generosity or unshakable faith or mm -hmm. urgency and execution or, or a courage to lead or leaving, living a life of significance, which are our core values. Mm -hmm. but I, I am actually, I live those out. Right. They come right off my tongue. I don't, they, I don't sure. even have to think about them. They are mm -hmm. who I am. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think step one is, is, is for it to be part of who you are. And I, I think that once that happens, it becomes easy to find like-minded people because we attract like-minded people. We sure. tend to repel people who are not like us. Mm -hmm. It's no different than a fraternity, sorority, biker club, you know, a, a country club. You attract who's like you and you repel who's not like you. It's, it's kind of like similar to creating a community. The other thing is I don't ask people the core value that resonates with them because, because then I'm assuming that it resonates with them. So I want to mm -hmm. ask okay. a very specific question about mm -hmm. every individual core value. And so uh, the core value, let's say extreme generosity, give me one time in your life where you gave more in an extreme fashion than you received. Hmm. Okay. And I want to hear what they say. Right. If, if, if they can't come up with something just like that, mm -hmm. then they're not extremely generous individuals Got because it. an extremely generous individual would be able to tell you, oh my gosh, I had this situation one time where I went to a restaurant I saw a couple and they forgot their wallet and I didn't have a lot of money, but I knew how embarrassed they were about the situation right. and the meal was $22 and I only had 25 in my bank account and I gave them the $22 uh, in that moment. And I hate telling mm. this story because obviously it feels like a humble brag, but in, in all honesty, I felt so good about doing that. Right. Uh, I never told anyone about it. First time I tell anyone about it, but it felt so good. They should yeah. be able to tell a story. I just made that up, by the way. That didn't really happen. But I, <laughs> okay. They should be able to tell a story. I, like that. I was, I was believing you that you'd actually <laughs> done this. <laughs> but, but they should be able to tell a story like that, right? Yes. And, uh -huh. and when they became, and it doesn't have to be just with money. It could be, you know, I, I was, uh, I was working with an organization one time, and I really didn't have a lot of time. But I decided to commit myself because I believed 
in this organization's values. And I put in all this time. And at the end of it, I was named the volunteer of the year, which made me feel so incredibly special because I didn't even do it for that. Right. They should be able to tell you that story. When mm -hmm. I talk about uh, urgency and execution, tell me, a, tell me a situation where you were assigned a task and you were so overwhelmed, but you acted with such urgency that it made a difference in the last company you worked for. They should be able to tell you that because see, if it's a part of you, right. then it's not something you have to recall. It's just a part of you. Yes, and, I uh, agree. It, That's cool. It reminds me of, of my, my older brother. He's a black belt in some, in some martial art. I'm not really sure what it is, but if you go to punch him, he immediately moves his arm really fast. Like mm -hmm. he'll block it. Right. Martial arts and defense is a part of him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to think about it. It just happens. And that's how people should respond when you're asking them questions about your core values and the people who respond the right way by the right way. I mean, they respond in line with what you expect. Mm -hmm. That's how, you know, somebody has your shared, your shared values. I love that. That's so valuable. That in itself is, is gold. Um, even if we ended the show right now, that would, that would be enough, but we're not going to. So, <laughs> um, I, I speak talking about values. I think too, that's something that's, and you can speak to this and see like, if you agree, but I think it's really important that not only do you have the values, but like you said, you are living and breathing those mm -hmm. values like all the time. And it's obvious to the people who are working with you that, you know, like it is obvious to the people that work for me that I value excellence, right? Yes. It's just obvious. Like I'm going to go back and I'm going to push to, to produce high quality, excellent work, right? Yes. It is obvious that I, you know, value personal growth. I'm going to challenge my team members. I'm going to learn myself. They're going to see me learning and growing. They're going to, I'm going to challenge them to look for solutions that they may not have the answers to rather than leaning on me. So there's, there's things that we have to, like you said, live and breathe um, those values internally in our company. And I think externally too, right? Yes. Like in the world, it needs to be obvious that this is what you value so it that there's it's congruent everywhere like everywhere you go like it, whether i'm working you know in the office with you today or whether i'm you know out there in the world whatever it's it's obvious yeah i mean it, you know we talk about internal and external brand consistency and i think mm -hmm. that, that that you know part of your brand is your values and so mm -hmm. if you want to have internal and external brand consistency you can't be one way with your team and another way at home uh, and vice versa, because that's going to create an that's going to create a, a, a an inconsistent brand. And sure. so I agree that you have to create that consistency internally and externally. And the thing is that people will catch on. You know, I'll tell a story. We we had a client um, that that was having an issue paying our services. Okay. You know, we're just going through a cash crunch um, in, in the in the legal field. Sometimes uh, revenue generation is is not tied to their performance. You know, you got to yeah, get clients to you and so forth. And I said, look, we, one of our core values is extreme generosity. I'm going to offer you three free months while you get out of this cash crunch and okay. we're going to keep working together. So we offered him three, three months. Didn't really make, say a big thing about it. Sent an email to uh, my team to let them know that this person shouldn't be billed, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Six, seven months later, another client not working with me because I have multiple consultants um, was having a similar cash crunch. Mm-hmm. My employee felt the liberty, my consultant felt the liberty of saying, I'm going to offer you three free months. We'll keep working together because they saw how I, how right. I was at centers with them. Yes. And now they are becoming who I am. They were, well, they right. were already shared the value, but in their behavior and their actions are becoming who we are. So when we live it externally, when we live it internally, people become more like us, mm -hmm. they become more. Uh, and we become more like them too. That's why we have to yes. be careful who we hang around, right? True, and yes. So, so that, that that's why culture is so critical is because if you start hiring people who don't resonate with your core values and your vision and mission, you you they may become more like you, but mm -hmm. you also may become more like them. And we have to be very, very careful about that when we're building an organization. I like that. Yeah, I like that. That is very... Um... Oh, I just, I like that, that you can become like them too. So be careful because yeah, energy is contagious, right? Yes. 
Okay, so let's talk about the second the second thing because I have a question about that, and that is like developing um, developing our people and giving them opportunities uh, for growth. Yes, I guess a couple of things coming to mind, like you know, what does that look like, and what do you do when you're dealing with someone maybe that's a bit resistant to maybe they like the comfort yeah. of like, okay, well, I've always done this and this is what I do and this is what I'm good at, but mm, no, I need for you to stretch and grow and do something a little bit more. So these are two very um, compound issues, right? Because like yeah. <laughs> w- w- one is how do you, how do you develop somebody? And, and then the second one is how do you develop somebody who doesn't want to change? And I want to address the first one because the first one is is probably going to hurt the most. It's going to hurt okay. the most because okay. the way that an entrepreneur uh, entrepreneur learns is that they learn by failure, right? We, mm-hmm. we get up, we fail, we, we fall down, we get up and we fail again. But for whatever reason, despite the fact that we learn through failure, when our team fails, we, you, you hold it against them. Mm-hmm. We say they're not capable. Yeah. We say they can't do it. Mm-hmm. And so the way you help people grow is you become comfortable with the discomfort of your team failing. Mm-hmm. That hurts the most. You have yes. to become comfortable with the oh discomfort my- of your team failing. Because this is the this is the reality of people. You're going to find people in two different phases when you hire them. You're going to find them already ready to work for your company mm-hmm. or needing to be developed. Okay. And if they're ready to work for your company, it's because they were developed somewhere else. They failed right. somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And so when you hire someone who is not ready, then you have to, you're taking on the responsibility of their failure. Right. And so when I hire, when I used to hire new lawyers mm-hmm. or I used to hire new employees who didn't have any background in what we were doing, mm-hmm. I expected that it was going to take six to seven failures before they really got it. They were going to, you know, when I hired my EA, they were going to mess up my mm-hmm. calendar. Right. They were going to double book me, yeah. right? They were going to forget <laughs> to tell me that I have an appointment. Right. They were not going to send me the link to the new show that I'm going to be on. <laughs> They're going to <laughs> fail. Right. And I can either hold that against them or I could build them up. And so sure. I think that, that that's the one that hurts the most because to develop people, it, it, does, it does hurt sometimes because they have to fail. And I've had people fail to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars. I've, you know, I had a new lawyer make a mistake. Uh, on on a on a specific case that mm-hmm. cost us thirty thousand dollars. Oh, now I could ouch. fire them, mm-hmm. or I could say I hired a new lawyer, and the only way that they're going to become the skilled lawyer that I want is to continue to develop them. And so we have to ask what is uh, the, the level of of tolerance that we're willing to give. But if you're bringing in people that need to be developed, it's going to hurt. Not to go mm-hmm. back to the book, but it's going to hurt, right? Yeah. The second question, though, as it relates to people who don't want to change. Resistance to change is an indicator that the person is not prepared for the next level. And so when you're building your business and the person is not ready for the next level, there's only two things that can happen. Number one is ask yourself, can you reallocate them to a different job where they feel more comfortable? Mm -hmm. Or number two, find them a place where they can work that it's not at your organization. Because I really believe that in the in the law of the lid, and, and that's you grow to the level of your weakest leader. And if you have people in your organization that are becoming weak because they can't handle the growth of your business, they're going to they they will hold you back. Mm, and the yeah. last thing you want is to have an employee because you feel bad about them to hold you back. And so when right. you analyze someone, you say this person's resistant to change. I only have two options. One is to reallocate them to another position, or help them find a place where they can really thrive uh, because they won't be able to be on the train for the next level of growth. Yeah. Once again, something else that kind of hurts, right? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And then let's just quickly touch on um, maybe just your uh, piece of gold on toxicity um, in, in a culture and how do you, how do you keep the toxicity like out of your culture, like in just a piece of gold that you could share with us? Well, well, the first, the, the, the the biggest piece of gold Mm -hmm. is as the owner, don't be toxic (laughs) because a lot of owners, a lot of owners, entrepreneurs, founders are very toxic. I'm just 
look, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I mm-hmm. feel like I can say this and I've been in, in the entrepreneur space 20 years. A lot of entrepreneurs are very toxic. They have mm-hmm. very type A personalities, yeah. very hard to deal with, very hard to communicate with. So the first step is don't be toxic. The second step is identifying what I call the disruption, the disruption of people, the disru- disruption of process and the disrup- disruption of peace. Uh, it's almost a tongue tongue twister. Yeah. If a person is disrupting other people, they have to be removed. If the person is disrupting the process and they can't be remedied, they have to be removed. And if the person is disrupting the peace of the organization, they have to be removed. So you, you eliminate dis- disruption by having an expectation that people, that process, and that the peace of the organization will be intact at all costs. Starts with you not being toxic, and it mm-hmm. ends with holding people accountable to not being toxic as well. I love it. It's so awesome. Yeah, I. That's uh. Yeah, I. I do believe in um, coaching to to a point, right? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes yeah. people like I think we all have like toxicity, right? At some mm-hmm. point, we're all none of us are like perfect, right? Of course. Yeah. And you know there are definitely people who are just you know, 95% toxic and don't have any intentions of being anything other than toxic. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's people that maybe have behaviors that are toxic, but they have a lot of other good behaviors. Right. And so I do think that we can develop people to a certain point Mm -hmm. and we can coach people to a certain point, but if, if it never changes, I agree. You, you need to remove them. And I think what, like you said, like, I, like, I really agree with you. Like, I think we ourselves as leaders, mm-hmm. if we can model how we want our people to be responding, that sets a bigger example than anything other than coaching and saying, well, no, we're not going to tolerate this kind of negativity, or we're not going to tolerate you not following the process or whatever. It's like, if you are modeling all of this, you have a lot, like you said, a lot greater chance of success. One of the things you mentioned was the concept that I, that I discuss, which is the intentional toxicity versus the unintentional toxicity. Mm-hmm. I think that you have to get really good at gauging whether an in-person, a person is intentionally toxic or unintentionally toxic. Mm-hmm. And you may be asking, well, why would somebody be intentionally toxic? Because that's how they are. Like, right. <laughs> uh, and I love, I love uh, the way you identify them. Is they'll say things like, "This is the way I am. I'm not going to change." Mm. Like, I can't help it that you're weak. I can't help it that you're. You know, when you right. hear people say things like that, they're intentionally yeah. toxic. Right. Unintentional toxicity is when a person does something and they're unaware of it. Yes. And so we do. We have a little uh, joke, a running joke at our at our firm, um, at at, at uh, eight figure firm, and it's we do this thing. What's your toxic trait? And so mm-hmm. um, I started just like for people to tell me what my toxic trait is. And they, they'll say, well, your toxic trait is you don't respond to email quickly enough. Okay, well, I didn't realize that there was a deadline that I wasn't meeting. I'll make sure I work on it. See, that's an unintentional toxic thing. Right. It would be different if I said, you're going to accept the way that I do things, period. That's intentional. Right. And so I think right. identifying the difference between those two things can help you decide whether a person needs coaching or whether a person needs to be walked out the door. Yeah. It's funny you ask that toxic trait. You know, I always say my toxic trait is uh, people pleasing. And, mm-hmm. you know, in, in some respects, it works really well for me because like my clients love it. <laughs> <laughs> and other respects, like it sometimes like pisses my team off, you know, because right. it's like, you cannot promise that. Like we cannot do that. <laughs> and it's like trying to find the balance with my toxic trait of like, yeah. okay, not too much people pleasing, um, but not like completely getting rid of like my high sure. need to serve my clients, yep. you know? So, yeah. so this has been awesome. Um, and I, I love closing I, I, every single episode closes with the same exact question. Yeah. Um, and that is what is your mojo? Like, this is all about being on a mission sharing your mojo with the world. What is your personal mojo and how do you like maintain it? You know, for me, the, my personal mojo, I had mentioned earlier in the show that I like to lead with love and show grace. Mm-hmm. 
And I think what my personal mojo is, maybe to my own detriment at sometimes is a genuine care for the individual, even when there's no financial interest. Okay. And the way that I the way that I have kept that is I have always asked myself the question, do I love people because I love people or do I love people because they give me something? Mm -hmm. And anytime I find myself loving for the purposes of getting, mm -hmm. then I put myself in check. And so that's my personal superpower. It served me well. You've always heard this phrase, nice guys finish last. I think that's totally wrong. I think nice guys finish on top. And so I've decided to just be a nice guy. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Louise, for, uh, for being here. This was an amazing, amazing episode, and I cannot wait to uh, share it with uh, listeners. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. That's a wrap on today's episode. Thank you for tuning in to the On a Mission Mojo podcast. Ready to dive into more incredible stories of people on a mission? Next week, I'll return with a fresh episode to ignite your passion for creating a better world. If you loved what you heard, be sure to subscribe, leave a glowing review, and spread the word to all your friends. Head over to onamissionbrands.com for more great episodes. Remember, the world needs your mojo, so go out there and let your brilliance shine.